will be in John chapter 19, uh, kind of the last phrase of verse 24, and then going uh, through verse 30 today. So as we continue this scene uh, at the crucifixion, it says, so the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Now after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, he said, I thirst. And a jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. It is finished. The most important words ever spoken by any human being in history. Those three English words are actually just one word in the Greek and it's spelled out in your notes there. To telestai. It's just one word is what Jesus said to telestai. And it means it has been and will forever remain finished. It has been and will ever, forever remain finished. Uh, this was a, a phrase or word used by the Greeks in this day during financial transactions, and it more simply means paid in full. So when you bought something, you got a receipt, or you paid for land or whatever, it was them saying, it has been and will forever remain finished. The, the payment is done. It's complete. There's nothing more that needs to be done. There's no more sales tax. There's no more this. There's no more payments. It's complete. And it will always remain finished. So there's a finality, a sureness, and unbreakable strength, and a power to this singular word. It's a word of perpetual eternality which leaves no room for any doubt. It is finished. Spurgeon says that that word would need all the other words that were ever spoken or ever can be spoken to explain this one word. It is altogether immeasurable. It is high. I cannot attain it. It is deep. I cannot fathom it. And Jesus utters this word while hanging on the cross, about to breathe his last breath. And so we have to, have to ask ourselves then, what is it? When he says, it is finished, what is it that has been finished? What is it that was so surely finished? We sing the song, it is finished, he has done it. We repeat the phrase, we smile when we say it, that we would do well to look more deeply and ask the question, what was completed here on the cross? What was it? And the theologian Bruce Milne, uh, he notes at least three things that it's kind of this it sort of is, three things that were finished. The first one he says, and these are in your notes, First one is, is Jesus' response to his Father's will. Jesus finished his response to his Father's will. Jesus declared time and time again that he was one with the Father and he came to do the Father's will. In John 6, 38, Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus had this perfect love for his Father, and he came to glorify his Father and accomplish the Father's perfect plan and the mission that his Father had given him to do. Just maybe a month or two ago, we saw in John 17, verse 4, in that high priestly prayer, as he's standing there in the 
temple area with his disciples listening on. He says to his father in a prayer, he says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So now even before the cross, there's something that had been accomplished. So this accomplishment, we have to understand it, it was not just the work of the actual cross that was finished. And sometimes we kind of think that because Jesus said it on the cross and that the cross is the thing that was finished. But even in John 17, he says, I've accomplished the work that you gave me. And that was before the cross. So it wasn't just the cross that made our salvation possible. It was the whole entire work of Jesus and his life, his ministry, and his obedience in his life. That's what made our salvation possible. Doing the will of the Father was not just simply going to the cross. So that was the big exclamation point at the end that sealed it. It wasn't just simply dying for those whom my Father had given me. He didn't just cruise through 33 years of life doing whatever he wanted, and then there was just one big task at the end. That's not how he purchased our salvation. There was a very personal part of Jesus' life, which is also an example to us, where Jesus also had to do the very will of God by being obedient at every point of his life. For his entire life, from his birth to childhood to his teenage years, as a young adult, and eventually unto his death. Following his father and trusting his life to him, following his ways and his wisdom, being dependent on the Holy Spirit rather than on his own flesh and the temptations of the world. We know that he was tempted. Those temptations that lure us away to follow after our own comforts. If there was anyone that ever walked this planet who had entitlements and preferences on how his life should be, It was Jesus. But he obeyed his father and he trusted him in all of it, even to the point of death. Jesus had to be obedient in every respect, never to break a command of his father's and he had to walk in everything that his father had for him. And Jesus walked into and through every single prophecy that was written about him following his father's will into every single one of them. And in this text here, as well as some of the surrounding ones from last week and even looking at next week, John points out many of the ways that Jesus did accomplish this work. John is pointing out to his readers that Jesus was obedient in every single respect and that the work that is finished is shown and proven even in the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled that he would be mocked with sinners, that his clothing would be gambled for, that his mouth was parched, even it says, John says, and to fulfill the scripture, he said, I thirst, that was spoken of, that his bones would not be broken, that his hands and feet would be pierced. Next week we'll see that he'll be buried with the rich. And on a more personal level for Jesus, his declaration of it is finished also signifies that his own suffering has also finished. The Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who held perfect relationship and union in the kingdom of heaven, he willfully left that place of perfect joy, left that perfect presence, and stepped down as a missionary into this dark, sinful, God-hating world. He became a little lower than the angels, humbling himself by becoming a man, and he was rejected. From that moment that he came to this earth, he experienced cold, poverty, isolation, rejection. His own people didn't even receive him. He was despised, and he was mocked. And now as he's drank that cup of the Father, his own personal suffering, 33 years confined to this world, was also finished. And he's now going to return to the right hand of him who sits on the throne. 
And so here in this moment, 33 years of all of that would be finished. Another category that was finished was the second one there in your notes. Jesus' revealing of the Father's heart. That also is finished. Earlier in John chapter 1, verse 18, John says that no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So John calls Jesus the only God. He says the only God, speaking of Jesus, who is at the Father's side, he has made him, the Father, known. God who is holy and otherly. There's no one like God. God has only been seen dimly up until Jesus, related through animal sacrifice, rituals, and his presence facilitated through a tabernacle. But that same God, the only God, came to this earth in the person of Jesus so that God himself could reveal himself. And he did this through his life and his ministry and now even through his death. He has now made known the Father to everyone. In Jesus' life and ministry, we see his compassion, his care for the lost, his uh, care for the sick. We see his weeping over the death of Lazarus, the embracing of the outcast, his disdain for hypocrisy, and his desire for his people to worship him in spirit and truth. We see all that in his life and ministry. But now here on the cross, God the Son's death on the cross also reveals so much about who God is. The cross displays both the wrath of God against sin, but also the love of God for sinners. We think about this in seeing God the Son, Jesus, who is the only true God himself. Seeing himself willfully lay down his life, as we just sang in Rock of Ages. Allowing himself to be put upon the cross. This reveals to the world that God is undoubtedly so serious about sin. He will not tolerate your sin. He will not tolerate my sin. God hates your sin. He hates your sin. The cross is proof of that. Justice will be served against your sin. It will be served against your sin. He will not look away forever from your sin. And so if God didn't even spare his own son, when his son took on your sin, my sin, the sins of humanity, sins that he didn't even commit, but that Jesus in a very real way put them upon his shoulders, if God the great judge didn't even spare his own son from his own wrath, he surely will not spare you. And think about this for a second. Jesus didn't even commit sin. But when he took sin upon himself, your sin, my sin, God the Father didn't say, well, since you didn't really actually do it, I won't punish you because that wouldn't really be fair. So I'm just going to look the other way. Thanks for taking their sin, but I'm not going to punish you because he didn't really do it. No, God takes sin so seriously that he didn't even spare his own son who didn't even commit the sin. But because the son took on your sin and my sin upon his shoulders, God punished him with all of his wrath and fury. Yet at the same time, the fact that God did not spare his son but gave him up for us, allowing him to take our place He approved of this because this is what would ensure us being saved from God's wrath. The fact that God did not spare his son also shows God's love for us. It shows simultaneously his hatred towards your sin, but his love for you, a sinner. It's incredible. It's incredible. You see this this duality here? The fact that God didn't spare his own son, that should put the fear of God in our hearts, but also should reveal the love of God to our hearts at the same exact time. See, God hates sin. 
And he hates sin so much that in his holy fury towards it, he intended from the very beginning to destroy it with every single ounce of his wrath and fury. Now that seems like something easy that he could do. Just, just destroy it, God. You hate sin? Great, we get it. Just, why don't you just kill sin? That seems like he could just do that. God, if you hate sin so much, just cast it into hell. And that would be very easy for God to do. Very easy. However, there's a problem that God faces. And the problem is that there's sin inside of you. And there's sin inside of me. And because God has this unexplainable, unmerited love for his enemies who are filled with the very sin that he hates, though he desires to destroy sin, if he simply destroys sin, he will destroy you and me at the same time. Because that's the only way to get rid of sin, is to kill this. You can think of God's wrath almost kind of like a cosmic chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is intended to kill cancer cells, but it also kills the good cells. Too much of that chemo will kill all the cancer, but it'll also kill the body. God's wrath is like a blast of chemotherapy to our hearts. It surely would kill our sin, but it would kill us in the process. It's the only way to get rid of sin completely. And so he has these two desires. He wants to destroy sin, but he wants to spare the sinners that are housing that sin. And so the cross is his solution. But not just any cross, a cross that he himself would hang upon. Because a simple organ donor won't suffice here. We need a full body donor. So this would be a cross where he would take upon all the sin of those he would save. He would take upon all their sins so that he could destroy their sin, but also spare them. And on that cross, all of your sin has been reckoned with. Justice has been served. For those who trust in the cross of Jesus Christ, justice has been served towards your sin. And so all of your sin was destroyed without destroying you. Because God's wrath could be unleashed upon sin and therefore destroy it on the cross. But yet God's wrath could not destroy Jesus. Because Jesus is God himself. His body is immune to this cosmic chemotherapy because he himself did not have sin inside of his body. He took upon your sin, but he himself did not have sin. That's what 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 21 says, For our sake, to spare us, he, God the Father, the great judge, made him, Jesus, to be sin. He took upon your sin, even though he knew no sin himself. He had no sin inside of his body, but he took upon our sin and became our sin so that in him, in him, we might become the righteousness of God. This is the only way that sin could be destroyed, but yet also have enemies spared. Sin would be destroyed through the body of Christ being broken and his blood being shed. It's quite a mind bender that the cross reveals so much about who God is. And a third element in your notes that Jesus finished was his redeeming of his father's world. The sacrifice of himself, who was the perfect, unblemished Passover lamb, finally appeased the righteous demands of the law. For thousands of years, God had mercifully allowed sinful and blemished humans to bring unblemished animals. An unblemished animal that had not sinned against God but served as a, a placeholder, sort of like a, a down payment or maybe a deposit, or as I said just a moment ago, kind of a, a full body donor, this, these bulls and calves and goats, they were like our full body donor, but 
In his patience, he allowed the body of an animal to take the place of a body of a man because of his patience. But in his patience, in that same patience, he was still waiting until man, man himself, could fully repay God with the bodily sacrifice of a righteous man. But that never happened. It couldn't happen. And until it would, both mankind and all of creation itself would groan in its brokenness and under that curse. It was promised from Genesis that both mankind and the world itself and all of creation would wither and pass away. But it was also promised from the beginning that God's justice would not be delayed forever. His justice being perfect would necessarily be served in order to uphold God's righteousness As I mentioned, he can't just look the other way. He can't do that forever. Sin and evil must pay. And no amount of lambs or bulls could ever do that. Yet man himself could not handle this cosmic chemo blast also. So here Jesus, the high priest who is also our Passover lamb, redeems the world that his father made by purchasing it back from the grave. What was once lost has now been found and redeemed. And therefore, as Hebrews 10, 18 says, there will be no longer any sacrifice for sin because it's finished, because it's paid in full. It's not needed. There's no penance, no purgatory, no payback. It is finished. It has been and will forever remain finished. Now, in these moments on the cross, we rightly focus on the the intensity and the majesty of this sacrificial lamb being slaughtered for sin, and we rightly marvel at what was accomplished on the cross, and those are just three things. There's so much more that the cross accomplished, but those main things should always be and forever be the kind of the trumpet blast that we hear in our minds and our hearts when we read through this text and hear those words, it is finished. Yet also in the margins of the text, we find something so important, so needed for us, because though Jesus indeed is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, we can sometimes lose sight of the very real, and very personal side of the sacrificial Messiah. See, in the midst of all of this, Jesus hanging on the cross, being mocked, being tortured, the pain, the suffering, even his intentionality and his focus he has in accomplishing the very purpose that he was sent to the earth to accomplish. Somehow in the midst of all of that that's going through his mind, through the pain, the stinging in his eyes of blood and tears, and somehow in the midst of all this, he reaches out to his mother. We have in the text here Four women, and also John. Three Marys, and also Mary's sister, who would be Jesus' aunt. And in his pain, in Jesus' rejection, in his loneliness, in his focus as he aims to cross that finish line and accomplish all that the Father had given to him, as he even fulfills those final prophecies during his life, in these last moments of his life, his heart is turned towards his mother. This is extraordinary to think about. All the things going through his mind, and everything going through his body. See, church, Jesus' mission was not just a task. Not just a checklist of prophecies that he had to fulfill or a job to complete, his mission was personal. And that's put on radical display here on the cross. In these past two and a half months, for me, I've just, I've never been through anything like this before. I'm cautiously optimistic that now I'm on the side of It's been our third memorial in not very much time. My hope is that I can begin to sort of 
try to get back into a regular pattern or rhythm of, of life. And, but I'm cautiously optimistic about that. It's been impossible for me to hardly focus on, on so many things. It's been impossible for me to respond to everyone who has been reaching out. Sometimes the most simple text messages, I just, I just get paralyzed. I, I've never felt this more uh, at capacity or even over capacity ever in my life. And I try to put myself now in the position that Jesus is in here, the suffering that he's going through. People are hurling insults at him, tempting him to come down from the cross to show that he's the king. And he's somehow focused even on fulfilling every last prophecy. He's just been forsaken by his own father who looked away from him as he poured out all of his righteous fury and anger upon him. And he felt every bit of God's hatred come upon him. And through the blood and the sweat stinging in his eyes and his heart and his eyes still yet somehow turn to his own mother. His heart and his eyes turn towards his friend, John. See, God the Father didn't just use Mary to raise Jesus. His mother wasn't just simply a means to God's end. No, Jesus loved his mother. He loved her dearly. And John also wasn't just a means to God's end. I'm, I'm going to use this guy John. He's going to be the one to kind of write the gospel and a couple of other epistles and, and revelation and he's, you know, all these things. He's just kind of a, a pawn in my story. He's like a trophy for me. I saved another one. He's another number. No, Jesus loved John. He loved John dearly. So much so that he looked at them and commended them to each other. He wanted his mother to extend her love, the love that she has for her own biological son. She wants her to extend her love for Jesus now towards John. Because he loves them so much. Even though now Jesus was leaving them in death, she he wanted her to extend her love to John. And likewise, Jesus wanted his mother to be cared for. He knew she would need someone to look after her. And so he commends her to John. Christian, you need to know and believe that you are not just a number. You're not just a, a, a trophy. You're not just a name on a roll call sheet in the book of life, some anonymous life on this planet, a name on a list, you are deeply loved, personally loved, deeply cared for. Jesus intimately knows you and desires you. He personally wants to interact with you. And his work on the cross that was was also meant to personally accomplish those same three things that we just went through. The cross was meant to personally reveal those things to you. Looking back at those, the work on the cross was meant to personally reveal the Father's will to you. Not just to us as this big kind of universal church. No, personally to you. He reveals to you what a life surrendered to Jesus looks like. You know now what a life surrendered to Jesus looks like. And he wants you to see that. That's why he said it's finished. He finished that job for you. He reveals to you what a life that is lived as a living sacrifice, both to God and to others, what that looks like. He wants you to personally know what that looks like, and that's what the cross accomplished for you. And he wants you to follow him in that same way. And look at that second one. The cross was meant to personally reveal the Father's heart to you. 
He wants the cross to personally speak to your heart and reveal to you how much he hates your sin. Not just sin categories, lust and pride, greed. No, your sin. Your personal sin. He wants you, the cross reveals to you how much he personally hates your actual personal sin. It was your sin. Not just the sin of the other people out there, but it was your sin that was being punished with all of God's wrath and fury on that cross. And yet he also wants to reveal that that duality of the cross because he wants the cross to personally speak to your heart and reveal to you how much he loves you. He didn't even spare Jesus in order to get you. You, your name. You're not just like, well, I'm just kind of happy to be here. I'm just, I just kind of got in because I followed the, the crowd of Christians into heaven and I kind of snuck in and got in the back door somehow. I don't know how. No, you personally. God the Father didn't even spare Jesus so that he could get you. He loves you so much that he allowed himself to be put upon that cross so that he could destroy your personal sin in his personal body. He did this all to destroy your sin instead of destroying your sin in your body. He wanted to spare you, and he did. And then that third point His work on the cross was meant to personally redeem you. As we see the care that he not only gives to his mother and to John, but also commends them to that care for each other. So Jesus has care, personal care for his mother and for John, but now he's commending John and also Mary to have that same love towards each other. The same personal care that he's extending to them, he's saying, now take care of each other. Bloodlines are blurred when we stand before the cross. John is now to care for Mary, even though they share no blood. Mary's to care for John, though they share no blood. Family is expanded because of the blood of Jesus. You share your personal blood with your biological family, you share a better blood with your church family. The redemption of your heart that the cross brings is a larger, deeper, and more intimate relationship that is not just with him, but with his people. That's what he's redeemed you to. So I I want you to just, could you just look around for a couple seconds? Make, Make some awkward eye contact with some folks. Smile at them. Don't wink, that's weird. But just, but just look around. I want you to think to yourself, behold, my brother. Behold, my sister. My mother, my father, my son, my daughter. You're you're a spiritual aunt or uncle or nephew or niece to the people in this room. Behold, church, your family. This is your family. (laughs) Amen. And Jesus personally redeemed you from being an orphan in this dark world and he's redeemed you to be part of a family. And you can look around, you can behold your family with the same personal love and affection that Jesus had for Mary and John and commended John to Mary and Mary to John. We look at each other and we say, behold, this here is my family. Before the cross, we are responsible one to another, accountable one to another. Your life is not your own. You've been bought for a price and adopted into the family of God. Your faith is personal, but it's not private because you've been redeemed into a family. And even in the midst of walking through pain and suffering and hardships and trials and temptations, we don't isolate ourselves. We don't run and hide like the other disciples that were not at the cross. We don't retreat to safety and comfort and self-preservation, which we do when things get hard, when they get tough. We tend to isolate. 
But we do instead as John and these women do. We press into each other. We stand with each other before the cross. And we behold each other as brothers and sisters. And we do all this because our hope, our faith, our trust, our resolve, and our confidence is rooted and forged in that glorious phrase, it is finished. God's will has been revealed. God's heart has been revealed. And we have been redeemed. And so we praise God with each other, standing before him and alongside one another, strengthening one another, encouraging one another with these glorious gospel truths. I want to close just by reading Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 to 30. And we're going to pray and we're going to thank God for these glorious, amazing, unchangeable truths. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Brothers and sisters, we will continue to battle side by side with one another through all the things that threaten us, all the fears that come our way, all the pains and sorrows and suffering and grief and mourning, but not fearing anything that's going to come our way because the battle belongs to the Lord. And our battle cry, church, is it is finished. Father in heaven, I don't even know what to pray right now. As I just think of that phrase, it is finished, and I think of that quote from Spurgeon that just would take all the words in the world to describe what that phrase means. I don't even know how to pray. Because on one hand, I just feel like we're, just, we're not done. One tiny, puny little sermon is somehow supposed to reveal to us the greatness and depth of this phrase and this truth. And yet, God, we, we trust the foolishness of preaching because we know that it's just a, a simple message from an even more simple human being, but your word is powerful. Your word is greater and transcends the short time that we can spend listening to someone preach a message Your word is alive and active, and so I do pray that as futile of an attempt that this feels to bring the truth of that phrase, it is finished, into our hearts, uh, I, I trust that your word is bigger than that, and more powerful than that, and is able to drive the truth into our hearts. So we thank you that this great and glorious truth will never be completely uncovered by us. We can explore that phrase all the days of our life and still find more. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.